Okay, welcome to everyone. Welcome to our panelists and to the audience. And uh, here is the panel that I think we're all afraid of, asking some, some dark questions. And I, I know I met a couple of parents in the morning who said they'd come in just to listen to this, so um, some people are taking this quite seriously. Um, this is an interesting panel, the composition as well. You'll notice that we have here the perspective of a parent and of a student in addition to a couple of authors. And um, I think this panel is slightly different and I'd like to ask um, one of our panelists, perhaps Paru Anand, to give us by way of introduction a small verbal paragraph on what dark literature is. Many people are puzzled by the term uh, dark literature. So if Paru can give us a brief paragraph. I think when we started talking about it, we were talking on two different pages because one uh, definition would be dark literature in terms of Game of Thrones or um, The Hunger Games and those are certainly very dark literature. Um, but I think I speak for Ranjit as well. When we think of dark literature, we're really talking about maybe reality fiction which is dealing with difficult and dark subjects and actual wounds. So, um, I, I mean, we, we could talk about both of them. <laughs> Thank you, Farah. Um, we've had a little discussion earlier, but I'd like to share this with our audience about these dark themes and dark ideas. And some people say it's the ideas and the presence of the ideas itself that can be quite a problem. And uh, I'd like to begin by asking Ranjit, is it, do you think it's the ideas or do you think it's the treatment of the ideas that matter? I think the problem really is that uh, we don't want to look at these things even when we are living through them. We don't want to acknowledge that there is a problem over here. And if there is, it's exploding in your family. It's, you know, you try to brush it under, your car under the carpet. One day it's going to blow up in your face and then you will not know what to do. Whereas if this thing has been written through what I call the escape hatch of literature, you can discuss these things through other characters, not necessarily your own, and yet solve your own problems because those characters will have very similar problems to what you have, what you're facing. So I think it's very important to sort of, uh, and of course how the writer deals with those questions or deals with those subjects is the challenge that we have, we have to sort of face and tackle. Paru, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is an acknowledgement that a wound exists, that the hurt is already there. Yesterday, I had a workshop with students who were from class, I think they were 11-year-olds to 16-year-olds, a big group, I mean, a, a big age, age range. And I was asking them, what kind of conflicts do you have? And I must say, they have written some amazing starting of a story, thoughts about a story on conflicts and on the kind of difficulties and darkness that they face. Uh, so, yeah, that, that is what I would like to tackle. I'd like to bring both Anushree and Tushar into this and ask them an interesting question. Now, given that, you know, children encounter dark themes and dark ideas, I would say in the nursery, in the form of fairy tales, right? And some of them can be quite dark. I remember some really dark ones. Why is there a concern later with it? What do you think the reason could be, I you know your perspective as a parent and as a young adult, growing up from a child who's read nursery tales and nursery rhymes? Tackle it first. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, very interesting you talked about this. So, I was kind of reflecting, getting ready for the panel. And, you know, you said it right. When the child is born, you know, as parents, we kind of grow with the child, right? We go from alphabets to learning about fairy tales, which is probably like 
It's four years old or three years old. And there is certain sense of morality in there, certain sense of right and wrong. The grayness is not there, right? You know, Snow White, everything eventually works out. Seven dwarfs, everything works out. Then you start moving up the Harry Potter range, right? Arushi started reading Harry Potter when she was six and a half. She finished it in seven years old. And that was gray. That got gray very quickly. And I think it was not about her ability to tackle the subject. It was probably more my ability as a parent to talk, to tackle the fact that she's being exposed to this. And am I also exposed to this? Am I ready for it? And I think that's where the, when you talked about should we fear the dark, I don't think we need to fear the dark from a child's perspective, but probably from our own readiness perspective. Are we ready for us to be going through that exponential curve of parenthood as the darkness comes in? So that's my perspective. Well said. Um, Anushree. Well, I think when, you, when I was reading fairy tales, I always saw characters as like flat characters. So there was always a good person and a bad person. But as I got older, I realized that there are many mo more sides to a person. And I think that is what makes it dark. And uh, I think why people actually have, uh, you know, a problem or like they don't really like it when children at like my age are exposed to dark because I think there are fe I think there are certain people who fear that when we walk out into this world we might uh, face such things and so they I well, I feel that they want to still keep us to you know like the nice stuff that happens in this world very well said. Very, no, but, yeah. but then they should very, very well, well said. said. But then they should ban all newspapers because there's nothing more depressing and all dark <laughs> to read every morning. You get up and that's the first thing you do, read the newspaper. That sets the mood for the day. Yeah, I can add on to that. So I was like nine years and I used to read the Times of India every day. And my parents actually stopped buying the Times of India because they, they were scared that I was reading about suicide stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I'd like to try a different tact now. Um, this is as a teacher as well, and I think I'm partly guilty. Some people tend to say that, you know, works with dark themes get taken more seriously. Right? It's considered deep literature. Dark literature is considered deep, makes you think. And uh, I'd like to ask our two authors, do you tend to feel this is true? Do you get that feeling from publishers and from the reading public and from teachers that you mustn't stray into too many, you know, light adventure, happy stories, and that sort of keeps the thing going? Do you think that's fair? I don't think that's entirely, I mean, I write because it makes me angry. I write on a subject because it makes me angry. And yet, no matter how dark the story is, you know, I'm a sucker for happy endings. I will try and twist and turn and wriggle the story in such a way that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. So I don't think about it as being taken more seriously or not. It's just very often reaction to something that I've read, that I write a story about because it makes you mad, it makes your blood boil. And you want to write something about that? Well, I think that um, children's literature for a long time was not being taken seriously. I know that when I wrote Nogans at my son's funeral, somebody said to me, oh, you've finally written a proper book. And I felt like telling him, you try it. You try writing a picture book. Why don't you? I mean, just shoot it out. That's it, how easy it is. But it's, it's not. It, it should all be taken very seriously. But to an extent, it is right. Now there is an expectation that on me definitely to be tackling these subjects and all constantly. And totally, yeah, I, I mean, when, when a subject comes to me, I will work with it in the best possible way that I can and in the way that the story is leading me to. But I think the question is, not that should we be writing about the dark, but it's how you tackle the dark, which is what is important. Whether it's in dystopian literature, because I feel something like Hunger Games really 
celebrated that violence. There was a kind of a lasciviousness about the way uh, that, that terrible violence was being portrayed. I'm not saying I don't think that it would happen that I read uh, Hunger Games, I liked it, and I'm going to go out and start slashing people to death. No. But I just think that the way it was just didn't sit right with me. Uh, if, you, if what your story is saying is, this is the violence, this is the thing that is happening, how do I move away from it? That's important to me. I, I think now we're in actually in Anushree's territory with Hunger Games, now that Paro mentioned it. And she does read a lot of that, I know, being her teacher. Um, I wanted to ask her, what is the kind of reading that you've done along this theme? And do you actually feel it has impacted you in life? And it'll be nice if you can share that for anxious parents and other teachers and your own classmates and siblings. Well, I did start off with dystopian literature. So I read The Hunger Games and Legend and uh, that kind of area. But eventually I moved on to like Paro, uh, Miss Paro said, that, you know, the reality, the dark reality fiction. So right now I'm reading a book called The Pearl, um, a, a Pearl uh, Broke Its Shell. And it's about a girl who is in Afghanistan in a very, very troubled situation. It is a conflict prone area. And uh, she has been actually married off at the age of 14. Her parents are drug addicts. And it is a very, very dark story. But I don't feel that these books really impact my mind to, you know, like start going on about what they actually do in those books. But I take it as awareness for myself and awareness about what is happening around the world. I think that was really well said. I think we should all just get up and leave yeah, and let her speak. I think she's doing a fabulous job. <laughs> Uh, on that line to Tushar, as a parent now, um, we heard uh, in the morning uh, about Maya's book, you know, The Tiger Mom, and although Tushar's a father, I'm going to ask him that question nonetheless. What do you see uh, your role as a parent in sort of helping children with their reading, especially this kind of dark literature? Do you actually see changes in your children and perhaps children who, who associate with them. Um, and do you think it actually affects them or you think we're making too much of a fuss? So I'll expand this a little bit more. So I think it's, there's dark literature, then in today's information age, all the other things coming to our children. All right, is this better? So th there's dark literature, right? Arushi loved Hunger Games. She went on to the Divergent series. She just kept on going on. She didn't, I think, stop. She just kept on going on so in terms of the books. Are you still reading some of those? Yes, she's still there, right? Uh, I think that uh, as parent, the biggest challenge for us is they're, they're good kids. They're not, they're understanding, they're building their perspectives. They're understanding life is not black and white. There's grayness to the life. How do you manage it? How do you grow? The, as parents, not only on the dark literature, but everything else that is coming to our kids, we, we have no option but to step back and be a better coach, right? To understand what's going on. Because we can't control it. We just cannot control it. So we just have to learn to kind of suck it up, for lack of a better word, and deal with it, right? And that's how we have to do it. I personally would have liked Darushi to be a little kid for quite a little bit more longer. <laughs> but I think she's matured up quickly through this, this kind of readings. And again, I have, it's my job now to mature up accordingly, so. Lovely, I, I, I feel the same way. I'm a parent too and a teacher, so it's quite interesting about these things dealing with children um, and what they read. Um, I'd like to get into something specific. Let's, to make this um, more specific, um, let's take one element in dark, one dark theme, perhaps the biggest of them all, um, death. 
and uh, how we might deal with that. And first to our two authors, how have you come to present, come to conceive and then to present this rather difficult theme of death to a young audience, sometimes really young? Um, perhaps Ranjit first? Um, well, I haven't uh, written actually a story in which you know, the main character dies or anything like that. Or there's, but there is death in the background, like in the book that I did, Faces in the Water. It's about this uh, female infanticide. Now, how do you write that for children? You know? Because uh, it, there is this little boy, 15-year-old, and he goes to his ancestral farmhouse, and there's a well there. He's told you're not to go near that well. So the moment you're told that, you, the first thing you do is you go to that well. And he looks down that well and he sees the, three, the faces of three girls looking up at him. And they tell him that they are the spirits of the three sisters that he had who had been drowned at birth. Because their family's boast was, we have only sons. So he is, you know, now this is a difficult, this is again talking about death. But what these girls show him is the kind of life that he would have lived had they been allowed to live as against if they, they, they're being dead because they'd been killed. And that life was far richer than the one that he had lived. So that's how I dealt with this death in, in this particular book. Um, I have written two books where the main character uh, themselves die. Uh, I have stories in which a parent has died. Um, and I think that children grapple with this with much more maturity, as you said, Tushar, than parents are able to grapple with it. And never has a child said, uh, you know, like my book, No Guns at My Son's Funeral, we, because it was the first book of its kind and we sent it out to schools to read it and uh, you know, how were they going to respond? Because if schools weren't buying it, parents weren't buying it, then how would the publisher publish it? Um, the, everything else they said was fine in it, except you should change the title. It's a very harsh title. No guns at my son's funeral. What kind of title is that for uh, kids to be reading? And uh, so we actually changed it to Kashmir, another side of childhood. But the night before it was going to press, I was just like, no, this is a terrible title. I want to come back to it. Um, it came out as that title. It became the fastest selling book for young people uh, until, until then. And, and it remained so for a while. It was published in January and republished in June. Um, it was literally flying off the shelves. Uh, Yesterday in the workshop, uh, we had, uh, you know, I held out three books and said, which of these three books would you like? And they all chose No Guns at My Son's Funeral. And I said, why this book amongst, you know, the others? And they said, because of the title. But in a, in a bookstore, when my son was buying the book because he had to present it to somebody, uh, there was this old gentleman who said, uh, son, don't buy this book. So he said, uh, why? So he said, because, uh, you know, it's, it's not a good book for children. You shouldn't be buying it. So my son said, um, it's written by my mother. And this man said, poor child. <laughs> <laughs> well, while it's still fresh, I'd like to go for a quick reaction to Anushree. Based on what you just heard, both what Ranjit and Paro said, and you were in the workshop yesterday on female infanticide and now about no guns at my son's funeral. What do you think about this kind of theme? Like in terms of death? Yes, yes, oh, and, and specifically these themes. What, what's your reaction to them? Well, I actually found the title of no guns at my son's funeral very, very attractive. I, I went and bought it like yesterday itself. And I, I haven't attended Mr. Ranjit's session, so I don't really know what to comment upon that. About the female infanticide that you just mentioned. 
What do you think about a subject like that? Would you feel comfortable reading something like that? Yeah, I, I would surely actually read it. And if you speak in terms of death, uh, for some reason, personally, death really doesn't impact me when I'm reading about it. Uh, more than like other issues that are in the book that are I find darker, like rape and uh, other sorts of violence, I feel that death isn't something that big and that dark. <laughs> That's very well said again. <laughs> we have a future budding writer right here, right? You know, just this morning I was chatting with Tushar and he asked me again about the same thing about dark literature and how vast is the scope. And we even went to the, to the extent that he said, well, you can't exclude even your religious books from that. So I'd like you to just take that point further because I didn't want you to say all that you had to say there. And I'd like you to say it here for everyone that even our religious books, right, deal with particular themes like this, but they deal with them rather differently. And our religious books, our own, the Bible, the Gita, yeah. yes, because with if those you really also. look at the dark subjects, right? Yes. You can't really deny that Mahabharat or even Bible, crucifixion of Christ, they're very dark subjects, right? That deal with death, that deal with every aspect that we are talking about, which have been glorified in a fictional level now, in terms of the other books that have come out. But if you go back to Krishna, you go back to Mahabharat, it, it's very dark. Yeah. It is very, very dark in terms of how, what the history is and what we're dealing with. In fact, to talk about the death topic of death, right? I think death is an essential element that we need to talk about. If it's female infanticide, it's a context, right? The, what writer is trying to portray is the context that that is wrong. And because that is wrong, that's how the subject is dealt with. And I think that's very important. Glorification of death as a matter of a game like it is in Hunger Games, that's what I struggle with, right? It's, the, certain elements are real, so you have to deal with it. Like Kashmir, right? There's, there are a lot of kids dying, a lot of people of every religion dying for practically no major cause, right? There are people who have strong opinions but we could live more peacefully. Glorification is what I struggle with. You know, there's another aspect also, you know, about uh, killing, because I did a book called uh, Battle for Number 19, and it's set during the 1984 riots in Delhi, and the last scene is when the, uh, the, the heroine, you could say, she is a very good archer, and she has to kill one of these rioters who has a gun to her father's head and has a little baby in his hands too. So he's holding him hostage. And she shoots him and she kills him with the arrow. And uh, the feedback that I got from the publishers first initially was, did she have to kill him? Couldn't she have just injured him and let him live? I said, that is not the point of the story. Because when you are face to face, you know that man is not going to let your father go. He is going to kill him and then he's going to kill you afterwards. You will do what it takes to save your life, to save the life of somebody you love, and it doesn't matter. You will not give that man a second chance. You will do that. And that actually does, you know, it's the fight and flight response. When you fight, you will fight to the end. And it doesn't matter how old you are, you will just do it. So, you know, there's no escaping from that. And she regrets that she had to do that for the rest of her life. But she tells her father, I had no choice. I mean, what he, you know, he's an he's a army chap and he presents her with the arrow with which she had shot this man. And she said, think not of the life that you had taken with this, but of the two that you have saved. So she learns that lesson and she still regrets it. I wish I didn't have to do it, but I did it because there was no option. And my, my point of uh, no guns is that if you take the path of violence, you end up as being a victim of violence yourself. Um, and Weed, which is the follow-up work, is where he is set onto a path of violence, but he steps away from it. So these are uh, really choices, and me as a writer, I'm trying to say, well, here are your choices, this is what could happen, 
take your choice. You know, take your pick. This That's exactly what you, what you do. You show the situation and let the reader make up his mind. Now the decision is yours. What is right and what is wrong? What's going to happen? I'd like to come back and draw all these things together and starting with what uh, Tushar said about the glorification. And we do something interesting in the middle years program um, to all parents. We get children to start creating their own stories. So it's one thing for them to read dark literature, but when we get them to start creating their own stories, then we get them to think about something like perspective. What perspective do they take? And often we encourage them to take a perspective that is different from their own. Now, would you say we need to draw the line at the number of perspectives, at particular perspectives. Let's say, um, I know children's literature tries to avoid telling stories from the perspective of the evildoer or the perpetrator. And I don't think many have moved in that direction even, you know, in adult fiction. But Anushree has studied someone like Edgar Allan Poe. One, I wanted to ask her, and then to the other panelists, do you did you feel disturbed when you read a story that was from the perspective of the evildoer? Because we create sympathy with the perspective we, you know, we look through. And would you be comfortable creating something like that? Uh, yeah, because when I first read Edgar Allan Poe, it was the first time that I actually thought that you can look at uh, from the perspective of the evildoer. Until then, I never even went that side. But now, if you ask me to write something, yeah, I would be completely fine. And I think it kind of removes me from my comfort zone, because I have to go and think into the mind of a killer or uh, an evildoer, which personally, I am not one. So uh, I would try and venture into that field. So, yeah. Would you be comfortable, Tushar, with children writing like that? So, let me add some context on this one. So, the, we recently, not recently, a couple of years ago, watched a movie called Maleficent. You heard about that? Yeah. Right? Till we had watched that movie, the whole storyline around Snow White was only from that perspective. From Snow White's perspective, and our belief was she was a bad woman. Maleficent. She did everything wrong. When you started watching that movie, you realize she had been wronged. Maleficent had been wronged so much and even then she protected the princess. So, I don't know whether evildoer is also the right word in this sense. So, if you're really, really going down the dark right side where the person has no sense of consciousness, that, I will be challenged with that. But if there's always another perspective, and if that perspective is there to be heard, we should hear it. So, kind of balancing that out in that end. This is not quite in children's literature, but um, in Malaysia, there was actually, they tried to create a safe space for people who had already committed rape to come and talk about what happened and why and all of that, somewhere where, where they could talk. And everybody shut it down, saying that no, they should not get that safe space. And I was thinking about it, should there be some such thing? And if, if we don't get them to talk about it, face it, talk about it with others who have done the same, is it a good thing or bad thing at all? I'm still thinking, I'm wondering. Because I'm, I'm writing a story on the aftermath of rape and how everybody gets impacted. And I tried to write it from the uncle's point of view who has committed the rape. And I couldn't find myself in those shoes. I just couldn't find myself there. Yeah. And so I've as yet And I think it comes down to your sense of morality, right? Yeah, you just say just... rape is wrong. Yeah. Like no matter what no context matter what, it is, yeah. it's just wrong. Similarly, in my view, female infanticide is wrong, no matter what point of view, right? That I would struggle with. Yeah. Right? That part I would struggle with. Uh, but there are others then where we really don't know. 
there are other topics which you could kind of go and explore. I have a big problem with bad characters because I always, I have bad characters in the book, but I always feel they're not bad enough. And I, I don't know how to make them worse than, you know, what they are in the book. But, you know, talking about, uh, you know, these characters, I just read uh, uh, the Salman Rushdie's Shalima the Clown. And Shalima the Clown turns out to be a pretty nasty piece of work at the end. But still, you know, you can't help feel sorry for the guy that, you know, the, the way his life has gone, that he wasn't, all, he wasn't what he was or he wasn't what he became. It was only because of the circumstances that led him. You know, he's a horrible person. By the end of the book, there's, you can't have any sympathy. And yet you do have that, it, you couldn't, can't call it a soft spot, but you do understand perhaps why he has become what he is, the monster that he is. And I think that's the power of, you know, being able to do something like that. And it's, it's very, I think, I would think it's, it's very challenging for a writer to do that. So then as parents, don't you sort of worry that you're kind of justifying the horrible oh, traits of the guy? I'm, I'm very lucky because I'm not a parent. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't, I would have been probably totally neurotic if I had been one. <laughs> so, I, that huge escape route. If you were to rewrite Mahabharat, right, for example, and you rewrite it from Dhritaraj and Duryodhan's perspective. I think the fact that Dhritaraj didn't get the throne was probably wrong. He should have gotten the throne because he's handicapped, that's an issue. Duryodhan then is the rightful heir, right? But the sequence of events and actions that Duryodhan took throughout till the day of Mahabharat actually established the context and storyline against him because from Draupadi Chirharan to sending Pandavas to the exile, doing all the things that is malicious in nature, essentially established him against the religion or dharma or what's right. So if, even if you were to rewrite it from Duryodhan and Dhritarash's point of view, I think that set of actions establishes a context which is against him and hence whatever end happens is the right one. So I, I guess that's where it comes down to, right? A person might be evil, but if the context establishes that, nobody's born evil, right? It's like context and the storyline establishes that, then you have to kind of acknowledge and that's part where I will struggle to kind of do it from the other side and say, okay, he was right. The same goes for Planet of Apes and all those things, right? Yeah. It just same goes both ways. So. Thank you, thank you, Tushar, for that. I, in preparing for this panel, I was also thinking about alternatives. What are the alternatives to introduce children to dark things in life? And one point of view that I came across, and I myself have thought about it for many years, I'd like to bring Ranjit in here, is the natural world. You write about the natural world and when children or even adults are connected with the natural world, you see these things, these images, quite literally, you see death, you see cruelty. I, perhaps your piece on the shrike or the butcher bird, right? And if you yeah. observe these things in the natural world, it's not literature, but if you want to extend it to nature writing, then you're bound to encounter these things and no one talks about it as dark literature. Do you think that would be a better, a gateway, a better gateway to understand these things? Well, the first thing is that in nature, basically, whatever violence there is, it's violence without malice. It's violence either because something is being hunted or something is defending itself to the death. That, and, and the animal world does not go to war. Well, chimpanzees perhaps do, but they are very close to us. So, you know, well, we have got things from or they've got you know, we, you know, it could be either way. We've learned from them or they've learned from us. But most of the natural world, a spider will kill because it, it's hungry. It will just kill because that's what it does that in order to eat. Not that we don't do that. We do that also. Whether you're vegetarian or not, you're killing something living to eat and to survive. Or you will fight to the death if your life is in danger. You will not lie down and say, kill me. At least 99.99% will not do that. They will fight. So that's, uh, that's sort of, with na and na in nature, it, nature is not malicious, it's very cruel. When you see, you know, these wild dogs tear a, a wild, wildebeest 
to bits. It looks horrible. It's very, it looks very cruel. But they're not, they're not doing it with a malicious intent to hurt that thing. They just want their bellies full. So that's, uh, there's absolutely no, they're not being moral, they don't have any, I mean, there's, they're just doing it because that's how they eat. It's like you going to the supermarket and buying a chicken. I mean, I see this, these films, this, you know, this, uh, just for gags, and these things from, I think it's some Canadian TV uh, serial, and they have these uh, chickens on the supermarket, and, uh, you know, the, the ladies, or whoever's shopping, they go and prod the chicken, and the chicken goes quack, quack, quack. You know, it's, it's a, it's a it's proof. And you should see the reactions of the people. But basically, they're t telling you that we're doing the same thing. We've killed the chicken. Now, but it's doing cluck, 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 and you think it's dead. And you have to kill it. No, no, no. But in nature, it happens without complete, without malice. Thank you, Ranjit. That's an important distinction. Um, I quickly wanted to also present another idea, and that is, we've spoken about particular books that show dark literature, but they, or dark themes, but then they show that very simply, good triumphs over it, or there's an important message, I'll just let that pass. What's the role of tragedy, actual tragedy? There's no happy endings. There is a, a stream, there's a tradition of that, and even for children, and that's starting to enter as well, and become more and more important, especially stories set during the Great Wars. Um, so I'll start with Paro, and then I'd perhaps like to go to Anushri to get her understanding of that. Um, what role do you think tragedy plays in children's literature and whether we should think of the two types differently, the ones where good triumphs and the ones that are generally tragic? I think both have their own place. Uh, I'm just writing a story called Grief is a Beast uh, because here's a child who has who is suffering great grief. And it's become like a living beast for her. It's this monster which is eating her alive. And um, so I, I mean, and, and for her it's absolute tragedy, but at the same time, I never like to leave it, especially if I'm writing for young people, leave it in a place where you're, you're leaving the child feeling hopeless. I always like to end on an upswing, at least like a glimmer of light at the end of a very dark tunnel. Uh, well, when I was reading dystopian fiction and as I continue to read it, I've, ne I've never actually encounter encountered any dystopian book that ends on a sad note. I think that's a like a trend amongst most dystopian stories that the, the main character in the end wins. So I don't really know what to say when you say tragedy and how that's related to dark literature because I haven't encountered anything of that sort. I, there's one more thing that has often troubled me as well um, as a teacher and we're talking about books where we can see dark themes quite clearly. But there's another category, I think, that exists where, you know, it's unintentionally dark. There is darkness in there because of stereotypes, because of the way people are depicted, but they're actually happy adventure stories. Now, that we don't often focus on. For instance, um, certain fairy tales that deliberately cast witches in a particular way. But the message is completely different. But these things are coming through by the way. Do we feel that that should be also separated and put into a category, you know, so that readers are warned that these things actually contain dangerous stereotypes? Should, should we go there, Paro? I'd have to think about it. I'd, um I, I, I'm never in favor of absolute darks, you know, of unrelenting dark, of like, which is even, I mean, I think even um, Darth Vader or uh, he who must not be named, which is <laughs> Voldemort, um, there, there isn't any, uh, there, there is no relenting in their evil. Uh, 
And yet in a way there is, like with Snape all along, there is something which, you know, um, where you start an understanding and that to me is important. I don't think I could deal with something completely unrelentingly dark. I think uh, we live in a very tough world and it's going to get even more complex. So anything which is, doesn't have hope and actually in these kind of scenarios where you're talking about fairy tales or fairies which are both dark and good, I think as we need to drive hope. We need to have as much hope that's there out there because there's so much coming. You talked about reading newspapers. You talked about, Ranjit talked about reading newspapers. Sia tells me, right, whenever I'm listening to news, why are you listening to news? Because everything is wrong, right? It's just depressing. So literature or the books are away, away from the world but also needs to establish that hope, that positive encouragement. Because what you're talking about is really our kids who are the future of the society. And we want that positivity out there. So even when you're talking about something really dark, as you said that one of the things that you find e even more frightening than death is something like rape. Um, I wrote an article in a magazine and um, I have got so many messages, emails, whatsapps, from very close friends, as well as from total strangers, saying that this is something that they experienced when they were young girls, and, they w and one young boy, and they wished that they had, ha they had been able to read something like this. When they were young, it would have given them the courage to come forward, because at that time when they tried to come forward, either they couldn't, or they weren't believed, or they were told, just keep quiet. So I think it's a really important role of stories to, to, to address those wounds uh, and look at those worms, bring them out, because worms will die in the sun, in the bright light of day, you know, and, not ah, in, and one, they'll thrive one, in darkness. One thing I must tell you, if there were no earthworms, we wouldn't live. Because they earthworms, are the ones. I mean those. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> but Termites. you see, this is, <laughs> this is, you know, where we, we don't, you know, I'm reading this book called Wild, and uh, this author is called, you know, has been talking about language and uh, our association with nature. And she will say that, you know, we talk about soil and dirt. Now, without soil and dirt, nothing would live, nothing would survive. And yet we treat it as, as something that, that, you know, you should clean yourself off. So, you know, she's looked into language where these prejudices sort of come in. But yes, in all these dark stories, you have got to have some glimmer of hope. Otherwise, what's the damn point of doing the story? If everybody is going to die in a swamp, again, I'm using the word swamp, swamp of misery and doom and despair, and dis what is the point? I mean, there's enough of it around anyway. And if you're going to sort of add more, more to that, and fiction also, I mean, what is the fourth point of the exercise? I think that's a good note to end on. We're almost at, out of time, the note of hope that lies there. And I think we'll take a couple of questions. I had plenty more uh, questions, especially on the ethical responsibility of writers and more importantly, ethical responsibility of readers. But before we go to the audience, I know for a fact that Anushri herself had a question that she wanted to ask. And I'd let her ask first and then we'll go to the audience. Uh, so my question for was for you, Ms. Paro. So you as a mother, when you are writing such books, uh, especially when you were writing No Guns at My Son's Funeral, did you think of it as a children's book then? And if you did, were you, was there any point of time when you were trying to limit yourself to the amount of information that you were giving out in the book or like the amount of bad, dark stuff that you were writing in the book? No, I never limit myself. Uh, no matter who I'm writing for. Uh, the story sometimes will limit itself. But as a mother, um, I knew, I had full confidence in my children that they would uh, be able to understand. But more than that, not as a mother, but as a writer, the children that I was writing upon, uh, writing about, because there are thousands of Aftabs who are being sucked into this vortex of violence and 
I was want I want them to be the readers more even than my own kids to be the readers. I think that's important. They need those stories out there. Uh, so you said that many parents or people don't actually like to read dark literature. So why do you think authors write or write dark literature in the first place? Uh, well, I can at least excuse myself by saying that I write it because I'm not a parent. I'm, I don't know if I had been a parent whether I would have written them or not. But uh, I still, I do think that they, these subjects do need to be dis talked about and written about. So I probably would have because normally, even in, in schools and normal parents don't talk to their children about these issues. Now somebody has to because otherwise one day it's going to blow up like a grenade in their face. Your 15 year old has run away with somebody. You didn't know what the hell was happening all the while. What's, what's going on? You know? So it's important, I think, that these things are written about and... Uh, well, I can... I mean, I can excuse myself. I'm not a parent, so I wouldn't really know it from that perspective. I, I write these, A, because there are children in those circumstances and they need to know that they are not alone. They need their stories told. I also write these stories to create an empathy within those who are not in that circumstance, but to know that somebody in their midst may well be, and also to give that ray of hope. So these are the three reasons why I continuously write on, on these subjects. Um, so um, you all have stayed in, um, in the space of talking about uh, real social issues and reflecting them in literature and talking about both sides, the, the evil side, the and the non-evil side of it and reflecting that. But there's a lot of dark literature that is really, really dark. It's psychological stuff. It's really, I call it monster madness kind of uh, thing. Um, so how, where do you draw the line? And how, so when children are lead, reading lit, dark literature of that kind, and uh, you know, I mean, how do you, where do you draw the line? Where do you, where do you say that, um, that you don't just keep reading this? It's okay if you read one out of every 10 books. Uh, or, you know, limit it somehow. Second thing is, how do you choose what is appropriate for a child at a certain age to be reading? Uh, it's just, I wonder about that. Honestly, right, as a parent, I struggle with that. So when uh, Arushi started reading, right, Harry Potter and all, we were okay, we kind of understood it. But when she started going to the Hunger Games, I had to read those books first. Right? I had to read them so that I had better context or read along with her. I uh, think over the years, she has matured and with her, Sia also comes along, that we have more trust and confidence because we've kind of built that up. But it's very hard, Kavita. There's no direct good or bad answer to this one. In terms of where do we draw the line, how do we draw the line? Because essentially it means we have to read everything before kind of providing them, and that's literally impossible to do. No, I don't think we should read everything before. Yeah. I think we really need to trust our kids exactly. to make the right choices, and if, it, if there's a question coming out of it, or if there are thoughts coming out of it, uh, you should create the atmosphere at home that they're able to come with those questions to you, uh, or to a teacher, are already there, you know? I mean, yeah, that very dark literature, they may read it, for a bit, as Arushi did, and mostly I found that they sort of read it, enjoy it for a bit, and then go on to more sensible literature. I don't know, that, that kind of story leaves me absolutely cold. I wouldn't read it, but my kids did read a bit of it, and then they stopped reading it. Okay. And it didn't impact them, it didn't sort of uh, mess with their minds very permanently. I'm sure it did for a while. I think it goes back to saying that we, uh, I as a parent, we as parents have to be better coaches because we don't really know what's going to come at our way, right? We just have to be better coaches and be able to manage it that comes our way. Uh, hello, uh, Ahmed. Here's a question. This is addressed to the, the authors there. Uh, have you, how much of uh, moral relativism or exploring moral ambiguities within people who are neither good or nor bad, but people being who they are, how much do you explore that in your books? Oh. Should your characters be fundamentally be black or white or does it explore, do you explore 
moral ambiguities in people who could be genuinely good, but in certain circumstances they could be incredibly cruel, like mothers and mothers and mothers in law, for instance, or fathers and fathers in law. So, uh, can you explore that? Is it because I think it's important for children to realize that at some point of time. Thank you. Well, there's this, uh, I think this line from this Bob Dylan song that goes, lies that life is black and white. I think that holds true for people too. There's no black and white complete. We're all grays. Part of us may be, I mean, we may behave very well and all that, but there may be a nasty part of us also, which is always there. Now, which is in the ascendancy, I think will determine the kind of person you probably are. But everybody has these, you know, nobody is feeling or thinking like an angel all the time. That I, I, I only want to do good and this, that and the other. There will be some little nick somewhere in which that person, as you said, could be extremely cruel. There could be somebody who says, oh, I love all children and people and all that, and then go and beat up puppies. You know, because they don't like puppies or something like that. So everybody has that. And yeah, it is the job of the writer to exploit that and to use that and to show that, you know, everybody is not necessarily all good, all bad. Everybody has their pluses and their minuses. And the thing is to balance those out. I, I, I did explore ambivalence very consciously in my book, uh, Wingless, where I took angels and made them into horrible creatures because we all think that, yeah, I am an angel. What I'm saying and thinking is fine. That guy is the bad guy, you know? And it's never that I'm the bad guy. So I took those who who are supposed to be the best and the holiest and have those halos around their heads and made them the evils. Because And because I was trying to say in that, don't absolve yourself of everything, examine yourself more closely. I would like to share something as a parent myself because I have two teenage girls, one 14 and one 18, one off in college all by herself now. So I was discussing about this literature festival and this particular talk topic and I was having a discussion with Tushar the other day, a couple of days back. Um, she told me, um, mom, in your generation, I'm like, oh God, how old am I now? So she said, in your generation, what you're trying to do is just to protect us and tell us only the good stuff. But let me tell you something, the world is not only of all the nice fantasy fairy tale stuff, it's beyond that, it's the real world. And that's what those books do to us. We learn from that. And how much are you going to protect me? I'm now off to college all by myself. I know what is the real world because of the books. I, um, I just wanted to ask, taking off from uh, what Ms. Kavita said about the really dark literature, where a lot of times um, the violence that is depicted in the books really is not like justified. There's no reason behind that. And the fear of a parent of desensitization like taking off from what Anushri said that she's death really does not bother her. Is that a good thing? Is that what we want our kids to go through? I don't think she said death doesn't bother her. It's just that she, she, she was saying is that it's, that the, it's, it's something that's inevitable, whereas other forms of violence or hatred and all yeah. that are not inevitable and therefore they are so much more. And that sort of depth of violence, death in itself is an inevitable and so therefore it's, it's less. Uh, no, I'm not talking just about death, but any kind of violence. I mean, yes. just taking off from what she said, not to put her in a spot, but you know, to, uh, reading so much about um, meaningless violence early on in age, is that, that, what kind of impact does that have? Does that actually lead to desensitization? We read uh, Naughty, Naughty books. I don't know, I, I don't know how many of you have all read Naughty books and enjoyed them and everything. For a while, Naughty books were banned in England because of the gollywogs. There were, you know, black people were uh, regarded as the thugs and thieves and the baddies of it. And so they thought that they were racially discriminatory books and therefore should be banned. Did we who read naughty books actually think that black people were th all thugs and all because of those books? No. I think let's trust our readers. Let's trust our kids. 
it's a, we were sensible enough to know that those are gollywogs, they're, they're in a story. Not every black person walking around is a gollywog. But I think what you said about violence is right because, you know, it should not be, you know, like we see these films when they, with the hero is there with his AK-47 blasting the daylights out of everybody inside. Now, have you ever been, you know, you just cut yourself and you see how you feel, how much pain there is in just that little cut and you try to magnify that into violence, that is violence then. Then you'll understand that, you know, what is the meaning of pain? Once you've gone through it, then you will perhaps say that, you know, this is ridiculous. And maybe in a way it's good because once you know that and you see this brat, 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 brat happening, you're not going to take it seriously. You're going to say this is all nonsense. They don't know what the heck they're doing because uh, A, when you're shot with a gun like that, you're not going to go flying 25 feet. You're going to just crumple up and it's horrible. So I think uh, it's sort of, uh, but yeah, you have, it shouldn't be completely senseless because small kids can be very cruel. So little kids can be very cruel. I mean, I was horrible as a child. The things I did, <laughs> the things I did, just experiment just to see what would happen without ever thinking about what was happening to that poor thing that I was inflicting this stuff on. But then later on you realize and you move away from it completely. So I'm a little confused here. I want to pick up from where Kavita left off. Are you guys arguing that there is no age appropriateness that should be taken into account before letting a child read the book? Are you saying let them read whatever they want? Even video games and movie come with age appropriate bandings. Are you saying that is not needed for literature? No, I have that problem because you know my real publishers always say, for what age group is, is this? Correct. I say, what? I don't know. I mean, I write from maybe say for ages from 10 to 100. No, but you that's can, fine. You know. As an author, that's fine. But we don't have a regulatory body here. So are we saying let the kids self-regulate? Does the school have a responsibility? In me, for example, when I visit to the library, we have books marked saying this is appropriate for middle school, this is appropriate for PYP. And I think that's a good thing. You need somebody to say that these books are not relevant for kids of this age unless you're arguing that let anybody read anything in the world. Yeah, I think some things, some kids will not understand certain things. But what I try to do is write the story in layers in which, say, a, a, a kid, say, from 10 to 12 will understand a particular part of the story, may not understand another part of the story which runs over it and parallel to it, which an older kid might understand and, you know, get out of and, you know, figure out. But yeah, I mean, up to a certain extent, yes, you can't, you know, if it's beyond their comprehension, then it then actually they will just put the book away because it will make no sense to them. They won't know what you're talking about. And they'll read it later on. And yeah, as a parent, perhaps you can then just check out or just, you know, drift through the book and say, you know, maybe you should just leave this for a few, day, for a few years and read it later on. Yeah. You'll understand it better yeah. and you'll find it nicer. It, you know, it, it's pretty, un, you can't, it's too, too difficult or whatever it is. Also, I think that there is, um, there should, it should be recommendatory that in a library or at home you're saying try this or try that are you sure you can really understand this and all of that but i think that um i think that taking that decision and that opinion away i'll tell you just one incident my um, in i was in a bookstore and there was this child young fellow picking up delightful books and the parent and the mother kept saying do you think that's age appropriate put it back do you think that's age appropriate and the child would you know say how did he know when i was growing up i had a house full of books we didn't have a lot of children's books uh, available to us there were some but not that many but we were free to pick up any book off the shelves uh, whether it was politics and history or fiction. I read Jean-Paul Sartre at 10. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the language. I didn't understand all of it. I came back to read it in my 30s. Um, if there are things, I mean, I keep saying this. Yes, you can recommend in a school library. Uh, if you feel that a book is really offensive and the child is reading it, talk about it to the child rather than say, you can't read this, this is not for you. Say, 
what do you think about this book? What do you think? What's it making you feel? What do you, what do you think is happening? I think that discussion is of far more value than just saying that this is not for you. Take it away. It's. Uh, I, I, I think today's kids, because they have so much access to information, banning X, Y, Z book has no value at all. I think discussion is much more valuable. Um, thank you. That she has, has a point. So as a child, uh, personally, I don't know about all kids, but when I used to find a book, I'd start reading it. If I didn't understand it, I would like self-realize and just, just put it back. Like I wouldn't expect, like I wouldn't go, ask, like I would go and ask my mom, but my mom would never say don't read it. I would just put it down myself. I started Harry Potter in third grade. I found it quite dark then and I just refused to read it. And it, it may be a little surprising, but I came back to Harry Potter only last year, and since then only I've read it. So I think somewhere we kids also have that thing that we realize what is good for us. <laughs> yeah, trust them. Thank you. Um, I must say that this was one of the most intense discussions we've had throughout the uh, entire day. Thank you all so much.